resistance. All right, so we started sort of dealing with resistors. We did some Ohm's law stuff. Um, and so let's talk about the microscopic level, all right? So conductivity, that's also represented by sigma, uh, which sometimes is charge density. But we've been using eta, so we're in pretty good shape. Uh, we're out of letters. And uh, so conductivity, that's how well a material conducts current. Um, and it determines what current density will be carried, created if you put a particular electric field into a conductor. Okay? So, J, what's J? Charge density? Current density, yes. Current, current density. per cross sectional area. <laughs> this is conductivity. <laughs> this is. Electric field. Okay. What? Jay's not a joke. He's just joking. Um, <laughs> what are the units of J? Amps per meter squared. Amps per meter squared, right? What are the units of E? Newtons per coulomb, volts per meter. Okay, conductivity is going to have some fun units. Anyway, um, so, have you guys ever used one of these? Yes. So, yeah, this is a, a device that tells you that you're fat. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I remember. It's a body percent fat calculate, like, whatever. Uh, what is it? Body fat percentage calculator. All right. Um, so, what does it do? You're fat. Well, <laughs> but how does it know that you're fat? I mean, it's not like a camera. It measures like the conductivity of the fat in your hands. So. Not just your hands, right? So it runs. You have a conductivity, right? Your conductivity is the property of the material that you're made of. Okay. So if you're made of muscle, muscle has a slightly different conductivity than fat. Okay. So your overall conductivity is an average of all of the stuff you're made up of. So what it does is it runs current through you. All right, it sets up a particular electric field, runs current through you, and it measures your conductivity. Depending on your conductivity, it can tell if you're more fat or less fat. Isn't that kind of irresponsible? Like, what if somebody eats a lot of salt? Like, wouldn't they be more conductive than somebody who didn't? Turns body? out your body's really good at processing these things. And it's not, if you eat more salt, it doesn't make you saltier, necessarily. <laughs> I mean, like, would it make you more physically. conductive first? No, not really. Because um, most of it's going to end up getting processed, right? So it'll get distributed, and, and the salt you don't use, you mostly just poop out. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, that's the... Standards. So here's your current density, here's your conductivity, here's your electric field of wire. Um, conductivity of some materials, so like copper, silver, carbon, carbon nanotube, right? Uh, this, this gets a little bit confusing because carbon, it has this conductivity, but it has some other properties that are interesting when you deal with electricity. But basically, a lot of wires are made of what? Copper. Okay. Why are not a lot of wires made of silver? It's expensive. It's expensive. It has be slightly better conductivity, but nobody wants to pay for silver wires. Okay. Um, although, when you like are trying to do your home sound system or your HDMI cables, or sometimes people will pay for silver or gold wires because if you're using it for one specific thing, not to do your whole house, it might be worth paying a little bit extra to get a slightly better. Uh, slightly less resistance going to like your home sound system. Okay. Okay. Um, let's not go on a tangent about salt. <laughs> so, better. Uh, B is for better. Um, okay. B is the correct answer. What's the current density here? So current density A, that's going to be I over what? The area. What's the area? Area of what? The cross-sectional area, right? So that's the area of a circle. So pi r squared. Okay. Area current density B, that's going to be two times current over pi r squared. So this is twice current density A. All right. Current density A is 
current density is C, that's going to be 2 times the current divided by pi 2r squared. <coughs> that gives you a 4. 2 divided by 4, that's going to be 1 half that. Okay. Last but not least, D is exactly the same. So it's equal to this guy. Okay, so this is the biggest one, this is the smallest one, these two are in the middle, and they're equal. Does the conductivity matter at all here? No. Okay, and so make sure you're using the variables that matter. Sometimes you have too much information, it's better than too little. Okay? All right. This is a about currents, I1, I2? They should, be the same. they should be the same. Why? Junction. Junction, junction rule. rule, right? Like, if any current coming into this junction has to be the same coming out. So because there doesn't split into other wires, right, current in has to be the same as current out. So I1 is equal to I2. But what about current density? I1, J1, should be greater than J2. You have a smaller cross-sectional area that you have to get the same amount of charges through at the same time, okay? So J1 is going to be greater than J2. And that means, since we know that current density is proportional to electric field, and these things are made of the same material and therefore have the same conductivity, E1 should also be greater than E2, okay? All right. Um, fun uh, side note on superconductivity. Okay, so here's our um, our equation for current density is equal to conductivity times the electric field. Well, for some materials, when you get to very low temperatures, conductivity. What what value would conductivity have if you basically don't have anything slowing you down? Yeah, infinity. Okay, so for some materials at low temperature, conductivity goes to infinity. And this ends up being really strange. So that means you can have <coughs> current flowing even when you have no electric field, okay, or no potential difference. So you can get currents without having electric fields to move currents, okay? So you can do things like levitate stuff, okay? Here's a permanent magnet levitating above a superconducting disk cooled with liquid nitrogen, all right? So things happen like, it, it gets a little crazy, we're not gonna get too much into it, but things happen like um, the, like electric field locking. So this is a, this also has a magnetic thing going on with it, but basically because you can have currents flowing even when you don't have electric fields, you can create situations where you have points of stable equilibrium where you wouldn't normally have them, okay? So this thing will have a magnetic field, but there's actually a spot in it where you can just set this thing and it'll stay. And we even have one of these in the back, but it's hard to get liquid nitrogen, so we can, <laughs> yeah, like. Uh, well, so when I worked at, at the UCs, right, there's like a tap of liquid nitrogen at like every, you can just go to every corner. Every research <laughs> institution, like in the physics department, you could like go to the back and just like, you just like take your like, you know, you have this giant doer, right? Like it's just like a, a giant thermos that rolls and you just like go hook it up and then you set a timer and you come back when it's full. And then one time somebody forgot to set a timer and they just left it running. So it overflowed and it was like, it looked like, you know, Night of the Living Dead out behind the building. So it's just all this like steamy, smoky stuff coming up. But here we have to order it and it, like, you, Liquid nitrogen is really cheap. It's like seven cents a gallon. Oh, that's cool. That's yeah. Cool. If you have it on tap and you order it by the truckload. But if we order it, it's like 40 bucks for like a gallon. So it's like, it's very, economies of scale there. But it's mostly that you're paying for storage and transit. Like you're not paying for the liquid nitrogen itself. So. <laughs> um, yeah, because I had a friend that did like low temperature physics. So they did uh, experiments on superfluid helium which means you have to be really good at building vacuums. And like like your vacuum, but like on steroids, a lot of tubes. And then um, 
<laughs> then you have to get stuff really cold. But the really crazy thing about superfluids, much like superconductors, is superfluids have this really crazy feature where they don't have any viscosity. So what's viscosity? Resistance. Sort of the stickiness and thickness of a liquid, right? So like, for instance, maple syrup, a little bit more viscous than, say, water. Okay, which means as you pour something, it, like it pulls the rest of the liquid along with it. All right. Well, what happens if you have no viscosity? Yeah, you can move like individual molecules. So, like you, if you stir superfluids, right? Let's say you put a spoon in, only the shape of the spoon moves around. All the rest of the liquid is completely still. Okay, it's super weird. The other thing is if you like, if you start agitating and swirling it. You know how in water, like a bathtub you get like a whirlpool? So whirlpools and yeah. superfluids are quantized, which means depending on the rate at which you stir or like oscillate them, you get different numbers of whirlpools and they're like finer numbers. So you like, you do it at this speed, you get three whirlpools. You do it at this speed, you get five whirlpools. So anyway, superfluid helium is really cool. Uh, superconductors are also really cool. And what's really crazy is when we start talking about like magnetic fields, you can draw these crazy magnetic and electric fields for superconductivity that don't follow the rules of the things that we were doing uh, in the last chapter. Okay, So uh, it's, it's a whole separate topic. It's kind of specialized. But some applications, anybody ever been on a maglev train? No. No. Why is a maglev train efficient? Why would you bother to have these super cold magnets to make a train go? No friction. No friction, okay? Remember, no contact, no friction. That means you don't lose anything to heat, to sound. It's quiet, it's smooth, it's nice, okay? They're very expensive to build, but they go really fast. And it's not that hard to get them to go fast because you don't have any friction, okay? Uh, let's see, what's some other super conductors? That's the best example I can think of. All right, other kinds of conductivity. Anybody heard of semiconductors? Okay, so semiconductors can either behave like a conductor or an insulator, right? So an insulator has a conductivity of zero. Stuff, current does not flow well through an insulator, which is good because that means you can touch an electrical outlet you have gloves on, okay? Um, just don't stick a fork in there. That has a conductivity of greater than zero. Okay. The semiconductors have this interesting feature where they're sometimes conductors and sometimes they're not. So they're semi-conductors. They're kind of conductors, but then they're also kind of not. Okay. Um, so depending on, and that depends on the voltage. So it depends on the voltage applied to the material. Uh, so here's some fun semiconducting materials: silicon, germanium, gallium arsenide, and you can use carbon nanotubes. Now, remember, I said those would be cool later, right? They have some lower conductivity than copper and silver, but sometimes you can turn it on and off, which is crazy, okay? So they, these things, anybody seen some of these things? If you haven't, you probably will eventually, okay? This, this is not in this class so much, but when you take like slightly more advanced circuit classes, these things come up, all right? Or if you smash open your computer, you can probably find some of those. Uh, don't, don't do that. Um, yeah, let's say a voltage regulator. Fun fact. Okay, so transistors can be in a an on or off state. Let's call on one and off zero. Can you think of some applications for this? What thing likes ones and zeros? Computers. Okay, that is considered binary. So you can store all your information depending on whether things are turned on or off. And then you can start building logic gates and all kinds of fun stuff, and voila, you have computers which are here and here and over there, and you know, that's all. All right? Um, here's a silicon wafer. It's very pretty. And this is a carbon nanotube transistor. This is a transistor size. This is 90 nanometers. You can fit 230 million transistors on one chip, okay? So the nice thing about this is you can make these things really small. And actually, I think you can Google uh, carbon nanotube radio. 
somebody made like a, a microscopic radio. You, it can receive one station, but um, just out of its carbon nanotube. The lab at, at Berkeley, I believe, the Zettel Lab, has a carbon nanotube radio, and you can listen to it broadcast. They have a, a thing online. So if you're interested in that, um, nanotechnology is very fun. You get to wear cool outfits, um, walk across sticky paper. Anybody ever been to a clean room? No? Uh, we, it's, uh, I've been trying to get, every year I take a trip to JPL, it's been harder and harder to get these trips. They have the biggest clean room I've ever seen because when you build stuff that's going into space, when you build electronics that you're gonna have to use on Mars, you don't want them to get dirty. And things like you shedding skin cells can make them dirty. So clean rooms are made so when you make stuff that's really small, you actually have like little small crap falling off you all the time and you don't notice and but like you know you know when you like go into a room and there's like you see like a beam of light coming in and there's like dust you yeah, guess what that is yeah, it's mostly skin dead skin cells right. right so it's mostly you or whoever lives there okay <laughs> maybe a cat um but that is a big problem if you're trying to make something this size because if like one dead skin cell falls on your transistor now it doesn't work okay so when we, we work with these tiny things in electronics you have to use clean rooms so what that is is you uh, I think you actually first take an air shower so like they blow all the dead skin cells and dust off you and then you put on a cool thing called a bunny suit which is basically a paper jumpsuit or plastic jumpsuit that covers everything you have gloves goggles you have like little booties on your feet and then you go through another air shower and then you like go through this positive pressure door. Positive pressure means they keep the pressure in the room a little bit higher than the pressure outside. So which way does the air blow when you open the door? Out. out. Okay, and you walk across like the sticky surface, you get all suited up, you go inside, and then everything's great. It's actually really nice if you have allergies because the pollen counts in a clean room are really, really low because the particle counts in a clean room are really, really low. Um, but yeah, JPL has one that's three stories high that you can fit a rocket in. Because when they build things like the Mars rover, they have to bring all these big parts in and assemble them in a clean environment. So um, if I can get that trip together, I'll let you guys know. Because <laughs> um, they should be working on the next Mars rover, right? Like that's what they should be working on this year. So we'll try to get something together. Uh, it's like up in Pasadena. Okay. Unfortunately, you can blame Matt Damon for us not being able to get into that because not and not like personally, but ever since The Martian and and Interstellar came out, JPL's been like really, really popular in a way that they I like. I've been going there since I was like a kid to like go on the tour and hang out there, and it never used to be hard to get in, and now. Just like everybody loves Mars, I guess it's probably Elon Musk is Instagram. Musk's fault. Okay. So anyway, the inverse of conductivity, if conductivity is how easy it is for stuff to flow, if you take the inverse of it, that's how hard it is for stuff to flow, okay? So resistivity is how difficult it is for current to flow through a material in response to an electric field, okay? This is also a property of the material, and it turns out um, you can calculate, so resistivity is the material property, resistance, is the property of a physical object. So remember, capacitance, what did capacitance depend on? The geometry, how you built your capacitor and the material between the plates, okay? So how you built it and the material. So re the, the epsilon naught with kappa, right? Epsilon was your material quantity, all right? In this case, the thing that defines the material is the resistivity. And if you want to calculate the overall resistance, which is R, that's going to be resistivity times the length of your object divided by the area, okay? Which is a lot, it looks, it's similar to what we got for, for capacitors, okay? So resistance <coughs> is how difficult it is for current to flow through a specific object. Okay, so resistivity is a material property. Things with high resistivity versus things with low resistivity, that's just for, by material. 
Resistance is for an actual object. Okay, if you have a resistor, it has a resistance that's only partly based on its resistivity, but also based on its geometry. Yes? So wouldn't resistivity kind of be like the same thing as uh, the K that we were doing with? Like, uh, I forget what, what name you gave K, but it's the funny, funny looking K? Kappa. Right, Kappa. Yeah, similar so to Kappa. Like, okay, so it's basically built based but on the material itself, not necessarily any type of electrical properties or any type of... Well, I mean, everything is at the, like, microscopic level has some basis in, like, at, at atomic properties. But, yeah, basically it's a bulk feature, right? The resistivity and kappa for epsilon, epsilon naught, those are just material properties. And when we deal with them in the macroscopic, meaning we're not, like, dealing with them on an atomic scale, we just know, we just categorize them, right? So someone measures the resistivity of a bunch of materials, and then we put it in a table, and we're like, done, okay? Um, what causes that on a microscopic scale is a whole different field of physics, right? Or engineering, depending on what you're doing. Or sometimes it's chemistry, but all that stuff's the same when you get small. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. Oh, and the, um, the units of resistance are ohms, okay? So R is for resistance, that's ohms. So here's a fun application. Let's say you want to connect your stereo to some speakers that are 20 meters away. You're going to use copper wire. And, you know, for the most part, we, we say that wire is, doesn't have resistance. An ideal wire has a resistance of zero, okay? But that's not, that's, that's really just a first order approximation, meaning that, that we, it's a good approximation for most cases, especially if the wire is short, but it's not actually the reality. So when you need to be more precise, you have to actually take into account the resistivity of things like copper. So here's a case where that's going to come up. 20 meters, that's a long wire. I mean, mostly in the lab, we have wires that are about this long. 20 meters is a lot longer than that, okay? So we want to connect our stereo to some speakers 20 meters away. We're going to use copper wires because we can't afford silver or gold. And, and we want to know what diameter of copper should we use to keep the resistance to less than four. So let's say you want to connect your stereo, or probably in this case now like a TV or a computer, to some speakers. that are about 20 meters away. All right, so this is a distance of 20 meters. And if you want to zoom in on this wire, we'll look at a cross section of the wire. And we'll notice that this has a diameter of something we'll call D. And we know that it has a conductivity of 6.00 times 10 to the 7th, 1 over ohm meters. All right. So we want a maximum resistance, so R max, equal to 0 0.1, oops, 100 ohms. And we need to figure out what we're going to do. So this is sort of a restatement of the question. We want to use our equation for resistance. So our equation for resistance is rho times the length. Rho is the, um, the resistivity divided by the cross-sectional area. We also know that rho is equal to 1 over sigma, which is the conductivity. So conductivity. resistivity. So here are our equations. Um, we also want to write down what we know, which is that, well, let's, let me make this a better, better sigma. This is sigma, the conductivity. And this is for copper. And I guess we can make copper wire sort of copper colored.
Now, we want to think about what seems reasonable, okay? So we want to think about a diameter of copper wire that we've actually seen because if your speakers had wire that was like one meter in diameter, you would probably notice. So we're probably thinking on the order of under a centimeter, maybe around like a millimeter range, okay? So the way we're going to set this up is we have all these values. So we're going to solve our resistance problem for the cross-sectional area. Well, we also know the area is going to be pi r squared, where pi r squared, once we have r, we know d is equal to 2r. All right, so this is all the equations we're going to need, and we want to solve this for r and therefore d. So resistance is equal to 1 over sigma length over pi r squared. Okay, then we're going to rearrange and solve this for little r. So r squared is equal to L over pi sigma big R. And then r is equal to the square root of L over pi sigma r. So we can plug in some numbers. This is 20 meters divided by pi times sigma, that's 6 times 10 to the 7th, 1 over ohm meters. And then our resistance, which is ma our max resistance, which is point, oh, what was it? Point 0.100 zero zero ohms. All right, so just to double check our units, you can see that this is going to cancel. This is meters divided by 1 over meters, so that's going to give us meters squared when we take a square root. Then we should get something in meters, which is good, because we know that radius should be a length. All right, so we're going to move this. And when we plug all this stuff in, we get 0 .00103 meters, or we can rewrite this as 1.03 millimeters. But remember, this is the radius, all right? And we want the diameter. So in order to get diameter, we just take 2 times radius, which is 2.06 millimeters. And that's the end of our problem. Now, does 2.06 millimeters seem reasonable for a copper wire that runs from your TV or your speaker? to your stereo or, st sorry, stere stereo to speaker or TV to speaker. Yeah, that seems about right. If you look at wires in your house, they tend to be around this size. So this is going to be our answer. So in this problem, we're just comparing two values, and anytime you want to do a comparison, the best way to do this is via a ratio. So we're going to go over just sort of slowly how to go through this in a ratio. The other thing you want to keep in mind is this question has two separate questions in it. So the first question is relatively straightforward. We want to know how do our resistivities compare. And when we look at this, um, we know first off that both of these wires are made of copper. So we have to remember, what does resistivity depend on? Well, resistivity depends on material. So if both things are copper, that means they have the same resistivity. So row one is equal to row two. So that's the beginning problem. The next problem, so this is one, the next problem is we want to compare the resistances. So how do our 
resistances are compare. And we'll notice that this is going to give us a different answer because resistance and resistivity are not the same thing. Um, so we want to start with our equation for resistance. And we're not going to draw a picture because you can see there's pretty much already a picture drawn for us, so that's not going to be necessary. But our resistance equation is resistivity times length divided by cross-sectional area. Um, and we have two versions of this. We have R1 is equal to rho, and we're going to leave this as rho because we know they're the same. L1, because they have different lengths, okay, divided by A1, because we know these things have different diameters and different lengths, okay. We also have R2, which is equal to rho, because they have the same resistance, L2 divided by A2. So now we want to compare these things. And to compare these things, we're going to start with R2 and just substitute in the values we know match. So we're going to copy this. Oops. Move it up here. And we're going to sub in all the values that we have. So look, we can see from looking over here that L2 is equal to 3L1. So we still have rho 3L1 instead of L2. And A2 is going to have a relationship to um, A1. But we first we have to break this down into uh, R2 squared. And then we know rho 3L1 R2 is equal to 2 R1 squared. So now we just have to do a little bit of algebra. This is going to be 3 rho L1 over 4, because when you square the 2, you get 4 pi R1 squared. So if you look at this, R1 is equal to rho L1 A1, all right? Um, A1 is this, pi R1 squared. And so this whole thing gives us R1. So we now know that R2 is equal to 3 fourths R1. So how do these compare? Well, R2 is smaller than R1 because it's, mul it's R1 multiplied by 3 fourths. So we're going to see that the resistance for R2 is going to be smaller than the one for R1, which is different than what we got for the resistivity. So resistance is different where resistivity is the same. Resistivity just depends on material, whereas resistance depends also on geometry.
much better. Okay, turns out doing the math, it works. Um, the answer is going to be A, but we can go through this because we didn't get like a full quorum. So we're looking for <coughs> the resistance. What do we know about the resistivity? Same. It should be the same for all of them, okay? But the resistance, so resistance A, that's going to be uh, rho uh, L over pi R squared. Okay, resistance B, that's going to be rho L over pi 2R squared, so that's going to be 1 fourth resistance A. So smaller, okay? Resistance C, that's going to be rho 2L over pi 2R squared, so that's 1 half resistance A. And resistance D, that's going to be rho times 2L over pi r squared, so that's twice resistance A. So the biggest one, the next biggest one, the next biggest one, the smallest. Okay. Alright. Uh, let's take a well, I think we can finish this chapter. So resistivity also depends on temperature. Okay, and it's a fairly linear relationship. So this is the temperature coefficient of resistivity, all right? This is the resistivity for a fixed temperature, so you just plug in some data points here. These are the initial conditions. Um, what does this look like? Well, it's semi-linear, okay? It's got this little weird spot right here that's not quite linear. This thing looks, if we could zoom in, it looks something like this, okay? So for the most part, resistivity versus temperature is linear, but when you get to very, very small temperatures, you can see that's not the case. And what does that remind us of? So what weird things can happen at low temperatures? Things like superconductivity, okay? So this weird effect at the low temperatures has to do with the concept of superconductivity, okay? So as T approaches absolute zero, okay, this, is, this would be absolute zero. I should go this way on the temperature scale. Uh, the resistivity has a finite value. That's this O naught, okay? So that's, <coughs> that's why this is here. So at some temperature, you get this constant rho naught, all right? Um, Okay, so, but this is a, a slightly related question. What is the purpose of the brackets instead of parentheses? They're just other parentheses. It's, that's just so you don't get confused by different, too many parentheses. All right. They don't have any like mathematical significance. Hipsters. <laughs> hipsters. <laughs> the answer is hipsters. Um, okay. Let's discuss this and vote again. The answer to this is hipsters. <laughs> 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 Yeah, that's the only way I see it heat up, and then so it gets really hot. So, why the heck do you carry it? There's a moment in there. Yeah. 